Good morning. Uh, it's uh, just gone 1130 here in London. Um, hello. Uh, thank you all for joining me. I'm I'm Richard Jordan. Uh, I'm a theatre producer. Um, full confession first. This is my first time I've ever using Facebook Live. So hopefully uh, this will all work perfectly. Um, it's a uh, live chat. Ah, thank you very much, Greg. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> I'm so pleased that the comments are coming through. So at least I've got on correctly. Um, so um, as I say, hopefully we'll figure this out as we go along. Um, it's a live chat. Um, so please feel free to ask comments and questions. Hopefully we might be able to figure a few things out together um, as we go along. And um, great, uh, let's get started. So uh, to tell you uh, a little bit about who I am, um, my name, as I said, is, is Richard Jordan. I'm a theatre producer based in London. I have my own production company, um, and that's called Richard Jordan Productions. It formed in 1998. Um, I suppose you'd describe me as probably a theatre creative producer. Um, uh, I'm a person who develops work. I dramaturg plays. I don't direct them, um, but I'm quite good at sometimes figuring out the problems of why something might or might not be working. Um, I suppose in some ways I'm what you'd call an old school theatre producer in the sense that I find the play, I work out how to get it on, I build a lot of creative relationships with the work, but at the heart of my work has been really striving to find a lot of a whole new generation of writers from, from around the world who've, who've come together and, um, and, and, and I've brought to the stage. Uh, over the last 21 years, um, I've produced about 260 shows. Uh, I've been fortunate to have had some degree of good success in the theatre on some shows. Of course, you're only ever as good as the last theatre show that you produced, um, but I've produced on Broadway, I've produced in the West end um one of my players was fortunate to win the tony award um for best play another an, an olivier award and why they're nice as i said you're only as good as the last uh, thing you put on the stage um it, those things kind of at least can help propel you onto the next step in your career and what you're doing um uh, they give you the sense sometimes that at least maybe you're getting it right because as a producer you know that's not always the case um but then within my work, I've also worked extensively in the fringe and I've worked internationally as well. Um, I've also worked in India and uh, I had a fantastic time coming and visiting uh, the country. Um, I was first brought over by the British Council in about 2011 um, and I was invited to come and meet with a group of new writers from around the world um, and from across India. Um, it was a group of producers who, who came together to do that. Um, and during that journey, I met with a, a, a vast number of writers. I visited Calcutta, Mumbai, Chennai on that first trip. Uh, out of that, I met a company called Evam, and I discovered a writer with them called Shakina Jacob. Uh, Shakina, I thought, was an amazing uh, new writer, had a play called Ali J, and that play we subsequently brought to the UK. Um, we then presented it in India. It became quite a controversial play in India. Um, it got a uh, uh, a lot of reaction to it. Um, it challenged a lot about identity and it challenged change. Um, and now for the first time in India, um, audiences can actually have a chance to watch it online. It's it's now available. If you go to the EVAM website, it's there for the first time to watch. And Shakina herself has gone on to enjoy subsequent writing success. But I found India a, a really invigorating country to come and visit and what was happening at the theatre scene at that particular point um, when I was there was interesting and, and I've been interested to watch how the country's continued to grow and in, in terms of its playcraft and its writing and I think there's some incredible voices that have a lot to share and say uh, globally um, uh, and so I was very pleased to play a small part in helping to get Shakina's voice heard onto a slightly larger stage and platform. Um, I also then came back to India in about 2015. I came with a show called Big Mouth. Um, that came to the Mumbai Performing Arts Centre. It was a show I'd created in, in Belgium and produced and toured around the world. And it came as part of its world tour. Uh, and so again, it was interesting on that trip. I visited Delhi and spent some time there and then and then came down and presented that show in, in, in Mumbai. Um, and I've been very interested as a person who produces new writing in the way that maybe there is an ability to find ways where we can create these cultural collisions, ways in which we can um, you know, bring writers and, and creatives from different parts of the world together and, and present them on the stage elsewhere. Um, I think that sharing of knowledge in, is the most important thing about the future of the theatre and um, you know the, the only way you get to keep knowledge is to share it if you do that it's yours forever and certainly that sharing of knowledge to me has been incredibly important throughout all of my producing work um, so uh, 
that's basically uh, the, the sort of beginning of my, my company. Um, to tell you what else I do, I'm also the executive and creative producer at the Birmingham Repertory Theatre. I joined that theatre in um, September this year. It was uh, quite an exciting time to become involved working with that theatre. Um, and that was uh, partly because it's gone through a, a tremendous amount of change. It's the third largest repertory theatre in the world, uh, or in the UK rather, not necessarily the world. Um, it's uh, a theatre which has got three performance spaces. There's an 800 seat theatre, uh, a 300 seat studio, and another space called The Door, which is a 100 seat new writing space. And um, those venues and spaces are, are very, I mean, it's the oldest repertory theatre in the UK so it was it was one of the one of the first ones to open it's in a much more newer building now but it's the place where a lot of great writers and uh, British uh, artists spawned their careers um, and so I joined that theatre to work with the team there in um, hopefully creating a new vision for it and in all being well COVID permitting May of next year that will begin. Uh, alongside that, I'm also the uh, Chicago Shakespeare Theatre's associate and producing partner. Um, I do a lot of their international work. So if you've got questions about American theatre as we go along, I can try and see if I can answer some of those. Chicago Shakespeare Theatre is on Navy Pier in Chicago. Um, it's a big uh, uh, sort of performance centre. Um, again, three spaces there. Um, they have had very strong links, obviously, with the Shakespeare canon, but they also produce a lot of musicals and uh, they have one of the most advanced stages that they opened three years ago called The Yard, which is a flexible performance space that can change shapes and, and, and do some quite amazing stuff. And once we've finish the talk today I encourage you to go on their website and just have a look at how amazing the Yard Theatre is. Um, um, I'm also uh, alongside that patron of the Brighton Fringe um, which is the third largest fringe festival in the world. Um, Edinburgh International, Edinburgh Fringe is the first, uh, Adelaide Fringe is the second and, um, and, and Brighton is the third. So again if you've got any questions about working in the fringe as we go along or bringing work over to the fringe we can try and explore that and answer some questions there. And in 20. 21, I will become the next distinguished professor of musical theatre at um, Western Carolina University in the US. So um, that's another great interest of mine is, 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 is musical theatre. Um, I think it's, it's one of the most important and accessible art forms um, uh, in, 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 in the, in the theatre industry. It's, it's about entry points and certainly musical theatre can afford that opportunity in a very big way. So I'm very excited alongside my other work to be becoming their distinguished professor. Um, and that I will begin in January, 2021. Um, my own, uh, journey into theatre, uh, was that I was born in, in Norwich, which is on the east side of the UK. Um, it's in the little bump of England, if you know it, uh, got, it was at the end of a train line. So growing up there, I, I didn't, to have, I mean, I grew up in a community where I went to a, a, a comprehensive school, um, so uh, it wasn't a, a privately funded school at, at all. Um, the kids I was at school with weren't really very interested in the theatre. You couldn't do drama at my school, um, but I was very fortunate that I had a mum who liked musicals. And when I was about nine years old, she took me along to the Theatre Royal in Norwich, which is a weekly touring theatre that um, presented different shows every week. So one week I could see Annie the musical, the next week I could see the Royal Shakespeare Company the next week I could see a Chekhov play that was touring through and the next week I could see a, a, a British farce coming through. So um, that theatre um, she took me along to, um, I discovered uh, a love of theatre going there um, and then uh, a short time after that we went on a trip to London and I discovered, it was my first ever visit to London, I discovered the West End, we saw two big musicals on uh, successive nights, Starlight Express which was an Andrew Lloyd Webber musical which in the 80s raced around the theatre on roller skates which as a child was, was pretty exciting to go and watch and then a, a musical called 42nd Street which is a big Broadway musical which was at the Theatre Royal Drury Lane which is uh, Britain's uh, well probably the oldest theatre still the oldest theatre in the UK um, and uh, it's uh, a theatre that still stands in terms of obviously the Globe and those that are, are much older but the Theatre Royal Drury Lane still stands on its site and is still the oldest theatre in the UK and it's sort of in original original condition the first couple burnt down but still even the the, the newest one that they built still is is, is still pretty old um, and uh, that opened up my eyes in a big way to London to theatre to another form of theatre and I was I was pretty hooked but of course coming back home to the to Norwich that interest was a very private one I, I couldn't really if I told the kids I was at school that I was interested in the theatre they'd have probably beaten me up so I kept going 
quite secretly to Norwich uh, Theatre Royal. I would uh, go and watch Saturday matinees. I'd often sneak into the theatre without pain, and the ushers would eventually get wise to me. And because I was a little kid and seemed interested and, and polite, they used to sneak me in at the back to watch stuff. Um, and then at the same time in the UK, there was a TV show that was going out, and that show was called Wogan. Now, that was a bit like, I guess, the, the David Letterman show and all those kind of shows that you might know that were on in, in the US. But they used to have different guests and, and people being interviewed one night and I was about 12 at the time and on that program came uh, a man called Cameron McIntosh and Cameron McIntosh was a theatre producer a very successful one he's the man behind musicals like Phantom of the Opera, Cats, Miss Saigon um, and he was opening a musical in the West End and the host a man this man called Terry Wogan who's quite a big radio presenter in the UK as well asked him what a theatre producer does and Cameron McIntosh explained he's the man who sort of creatively develops the show he finds the theatre he puts it all together and the thing that interested me I suddenly realised I had a job um, I was never interested in being on stage but I liked how it all got put together and so again I didn't know anyone who worked in the theatre none of my family worked in the theatre at all my 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 mum had helped children with their reading she she was a sort of classroom assistant um, my grandma had, had, had worked in a in a supermarket so my my background in theatre was a very you know very new one to all of them as well and that's something they'd encouraged um, and I was a keen reader, so they were enthusiastic about, about that interest, but it was something they didn't really understand. So um, Norwich in those days, in the 80s, had a very big library, and in that library they used to have all the phone directories for different parts of the UK. And um, I went in and I found the phone directory for London, and in there I found the address, because they have phone numbers and the addresses of people and I found the address for the offices of Cameron McIntosh because he was the only theatre producer I'd heard of and I wrote him a letter and that letter said you know dear Mr McIntosh I want to be a theatre producer I come from Norwich I don't know what to do um uh you know can you can you help me and about um uh four or five weeks later a letter came back and uh, that letter said thank you for your letter and if you're serious about working in the theatre you need to do every job in the theatre and go to the theatre as much as possible and in truth, that really was the checkered flag, because if if that letter hadn't arrived, I probably wouldn't be sitting talking to you now, because I don't know how I would have found my path or my way coming through to that. I probably might have done eventually and done something, but it really spurred, spurred me on. I mean, you got to say my, my school, my, my teachers were encouraging me to be a car mechanic. That's what they would wanted me to sort of go off and maybe pursue a career like that. So it was it was something that they were not particularly encouraging as to as to pursue in, in going into the theatre at all. So really, this was someone who I didn't know, but I could see was doing something that interested me. And it really pursued me into wanting to go off and chase that that dream. And so um, uh, uh, you know, the letter came back and, and really from that point onwards, Saturday afternoons at Norwich Theatre Royal were my classroom. And as I said, I was going there religiously. I could see when well, we never had a lot of money. So sometimes what I would do is if Romeo and Juliet had been playing, I'd, I'd go and read the first act of Romeo and Juliet from the library. And then I'd sneak in and watch the second half of the show. So at least I knew what was going on sometimes. And as I say, the more times I went, the more I learned as I was going into the theatre. And, and, and it was somewhere I felt very safe. I felt very connected with it, you know, and, and I went in and, and I I felt at home, I think would be how I felt. But what I realised now when I look back was I was watching a lot of these shows from the back of an auditorium. So in a sense, I was sitting there and I was seeing how the show reacted uh, at the back of the audience. So I could see how the audience reacted and how it connected and how those things sort of came along as they as as, as they went as they went through. And, and that became really important to me. Um, I think theatre itself is really important um, to think about exchange. We'll come and talk about some of the, you know, the, 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 the situation in the UK as it is today and, and also about some of the, the big differences between the UK and, and, and India and, and other places in the world as we go along. But ultimately, the one thing that we all, we all share in, in, in theatre as an experience is exchange. It's about that we as, as theatre artists, theatre makers, theatre producers, directors have to constantly think about and it's how we make our exchanges with each other and with audiences. Um, and what I'd say is that watching those shows and going into the theatre as a child, you realise how important that is when you look back on it and actually what a responsibility it is that we 
uh, all hold in in really that that delivery because if you can hook a, a, a young person on the theatre you can hook them for life and actually in a way for the, the for the short time that we all work in the theatre before we pass it on to the baton to the next generation we really are the guardians that are involved with doing that and, and we're very responsible for the choices and the decisions that we choose to take and that's a tremendous responsibility that none of us should ever really un, un, underrate or undervalue about how important that is and that engagement is 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 is, is is really special which is why i always say the most important seat in the theater is actually that one that's right at the very very back of the third balcony to the left which may be slightly restricted view but what it can do is there might be a young person there that if you can get the reach of that show to that young person and they can connect with it you've possibly hooked them for life um it's why i have a big bugbear when i watch shows that i'm producing where often the director never sits in any other seat other than the best seat in the stalls um you know you if you want to make a show work you have to sit at different places around the theatre to really see how that show works and how that engages and how it connects and you know that 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 I, I said when you go in as a as a as a young person watching a show and, and and thinking about it you know for me when I think about you know the first time I saw Hamlet as a kid I, I didn't know the story of Hamlet so at that point I'm I'm at that moment, I'm almost like a groundling for one second when I think back of it at the Globe Theatre, because, of course, when Hamlet was first performed there, well, not one of those people knew what that story was. So you have this moment of this really extraordinary exchange that goes over, you know, centuries. But it happens often for you as a, as a very young person at that particular moment when you go into those classic plays. And of course, when you go in, you're like a vacuum cleaner because you're hoovering it all up in a, in a really you know, thrilling and ex exhilarating way. And in a sense, you're, you're not looking at that long legacy. You're just looking at that particular moment. But that vacuum cleaner of hoovering it up, taking it all in and absorbing it is fantastic, which might mean that the Hamlet that you see the first time may not by a long way be the best Hamlet that you'll ever see, but I guarantee it'll be the one that you never forget. And that that's an incredibly important thing I think about any show that you produce that the first time you put that on stage there will be someone there in that audience who's perhaps there at the theatre for the first time but when you produce a new play especially of course that audience is coming to it completely for the first time that you experience that and and, and that could be a show that you create that could have a very long life afterwards or it could have a, a, a connection but the connection that you make with that audience you, you have to sort of as I say never ever undervalue how how important that is and so for me anyway I was back in, in Norwich going back to to, to, to where I was at that point watching shows at that same time on a Friday night I discovered Norwich Art Centre and Norwich Art Centre did a whole range of um, different alternative art on a Friday night so there were people at that time like Simon McBurney who runs the Theatre de Complicité company well he was a very young artist starting in those days he was passing through Norwich and trying out one of his shows that was on his way to the Edinburgh Fringe so I suddenly go in and I've seen all this stuff as well so I was actually seeing a whole range of work on the one at Norwich Theatre Royal I was seeing these large what you call commercial touring shows often coming through. At Norwich Arts Centre, I was seeing all this experimental work. And what I've realised in my own work is that, you know, I like lots of different things. That collision of those two organisations, for me, was really important because I think it's influenced so much of the work that I've gone on to produce. The one thing I can't stand is, is it when, when people marginalise work in theatre and say, well, you've got to like this because that's this or that's what you, you know, you know, you've got you've got to like something else. You 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 can't like two different things. You know, when I meet people who say uh, I love musicals, but I uh, you know I, I hate musicals, but I love Stephen Sondheim, I always find it's a really stupid comment because you never know where that next idea or that great opportunity or, or or piece of work that's going to inspire you will come from. And that's why I think fluidity is 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 just so important in the theatre and and going in it with an open mind. And sometimes we can we can you know be a little bit closed minded to stuff. And I think it's it's really important not to approach that. And certainly within my own work, it's influenced me a great deal. And it's certainly influenced me a great deal with a lot of the international work and the collaborations I've gone to do. So anyway, I was I was rolling on in, in, in Norwich. I was going to the theatre. And then at that particular point, um, it led on to having to do work experience at school. And I, as I say, my school wanted me to be a car mechanic. <laughs> Didn't want to do that. So I wrote another letter to Cameron McIntosh and said, look, this is what, what I'm being offered. Is there any chance I could please come and work for you in some way? And about, again, a few weeks later, a letter came back and it said, there's a week going on one of my musicals, it's a musical called Cats in the West End. You can come and do work experience on that if you would like. And that was my first time ever being inside a theatre. I was 15 at the time and I um, stepped into that theatre and uh, I spent some time working backstage, learning on that week, on lots of different shows. And something went well because by the end of that week, they offered me a job. 
and uh, at the end of my school studies uh, that summer, when I was 16, I then began as a stagehand on Cats in the West End. Um, I then got a job alongside that working in a producer's office and he was taking a show to the Edinburgh Fringe. So um, uh, shortly after that, I actually went up and, and, and went to Edinburgh with that and discovered a, an amazing you know, place of theatre energy and, and connections and work and seeing stuff. And I'd learned very quickly from that that actually the next step maybe for me would be to train as a stage manager. Um, I'd learned quite quickly that stage management was a great way of um, you know, learning about all the different bits and pieces that go on in a theatre show. Of course, you're in the rehearsal room a lot, seeing what's happening. And so I applied to some drama schools and the one I'd applied to train at was a school called the Oxford School of Drama. And that linked to, uh, which I'd been encouraged to apply for a chair of drama that was at Oxford um, and uh, a different professorship held that chair. There were three non-university places for that professorship to also be on alongside the, the, the school itself, the study, you know, where you would study at the school and you would be able to go and, and, and take part in all these supplementary lectures. And the first person who held that chair was a man called Alan Akeborn, a very successful British playwright that some of you may know. The second person was a man called Michael Codron. Now, Michael, you probably may not know, but Michael is probably one of the most important theatre producers in the UK. He's the man who discovered Tom Stoppard, Joe Orton, Michael Frayne, Alan Bennett. Uh, so he knew a thing or two about playwriting. Harold Pinter, another one of his, 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 his discoveries. And so I got on to, luckily enough, to go on the stage management course at, at Oxford and then also to be chosen for one of those three places to, to study on that. And so with Alan Aikman, I learned about playcraft and I learned about um, how plays get put together and how plays work. And then with Michael, who took the chair on from him afterwards, I learned about producing and, and really the, the craft of, of theatre producing and the art of it. Um, and when I finished studying, I was fortunate that Alan Aikborn, who ran a theatre at that time in the UK in the town of Scarborough, the Yorkshire town of Scarborough, a theatre in the round where all his plays premiered, invited me to join him uh, as assistant stage manager uh, on a season. And I did that, and then I worked as a stage manager on some different shows. Then I moved into running some theatres regionally. And then uh, one day I was working regionally, in, I moved into theatre management, and I'd started to learn about how deals worked on shows and how things connected like that. So I'd sort of sidestepped a little more from stage management and had used those skills, but then felt I needed to learn a little bit more about how theatres work. And there was a big theatre in the UK that had just opened at that point called the Wickham Swan Theatre in High Wickham. It was Britain's newest theatre at that point, 1,070 six seat theatre and a 300 seat studio theatre and they needed someone to come there and be the assistant general manager and so I joined that theatre spent two years there learning how a new theatre reopens or, or opens and sets up and, and uh, it was again a theatre a lot like Norwich it presented a lot of different work coming through that theatre and at that point one day the phone rang in my office in um, High Wycombe at the theatre there at the Wycombe Swan and at the end of the phone a voice said do you still want to be a theatre producer? And that um, voice was Michael Codron at the end of the phone. And, and a little tip I'd give you was I kept in touch with my drama school. I'd always told them what I was doing, what I was up to. You know, I kept in touch with the teachers. And Michael had remembered me, uh, didn't know how to get hold of me. So he he called my old drama school and said, do you remember that that boy who was uh, on, on the course? Uh, you know, do you know what he's doing? I, I'd quite like to connect him. Uh, there might be a, 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 a job or, or something that I'm needing somebody to come and work in my office. And because I kept in touch with them, they could say, yes, he's working here. Here's his phone number. And so I had a, a phone call and uh, he said, uh, all he said at the end of the phone was, do you still want to be a theatre producer? And I said, yes, more than anything. And he said, come down and meet me in my office. And five weeks later, I started working for Michael in the West End. And that really was the point that I started to learn about how theatre worked, because Michael ran a theatre in London as well called the Aldridge Theatre. Uh, it was a really beautiful theatre, but he ran it for the Broadway producer, a man called uh, James Needlander. And in New York, uh, James Needlander and his son, James, there used to be Jimmy Senior, he's just passed away, and J Jimmy Junior, uh, ran a whole bunch of theatres. They're one of the most important theatre owners in, in, on Broadway. And um, and he, uh, he was was a, a iconic man, Jimmy. I mean, Jimmy also owned part of the Yankees uh, baseball team. So the way Jimmy often worked on theatre shows was he had a great big cigar and he used to have these um, uh, you know baseball caps, the Yankees baseball caps, and everything he ever talked to you about with the theatre show, his analogy was to do with baseball. So it was, it was very bizarre having a 
conversation with him because he'd sit there talking about you know your pitch being your show and your home run being your hit. And it was a certain way of, 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 of producing, um, not necessarily, you know, it was just an interesting style of environment to work in. But the thing he had was he had an amazing eye on shows. He understood how things connected together. And so, of course, suddenly being in that environment, and I was about what? 1920 at this point so i 20 i think i was 21 i was hoovering this up like crazy because you know i'd be the first in the morning to get there last in the morning to leave the atmosphere of stuff that was going on we were producing shows we were doing a show with um felicity kendall and art malik called indian ink um which was a tom stoppard play which michael had produced and brought to the stage and and that was a, a fantastic play and then we were doing a play called the shakespeare review and 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 lots of things and then at that point michael also owned another theater um in london and I called the Vaudeville Theatre and I worked with him in the theatre management of those as well. Um, and um, at that point, then the National Theatre, um, a little while later, um, started to be looking for someone who had stage management experience and theatre management experience who um, could possibly come and work with them and be involved in working in one of their auditoriums. And that was the Cottesloe Theatre. Now, if you know the National, the National has three different auditoriums. The Cottesloe is the smallest theatre there. And they came and asked me if I'd consider applying for that. And so I applied for the, the job, uh, went down and, and met them. And um, I felt like going to a producing theatre was the last part of my puzzle in terms of learning about the craft and the art of producing and, and about how theatres work. Because obviously it's a very different kind of environment working there to say a commercial West End theatre. Um, and I got that job, which was wonderful. And I, I started as um, line manager on the theatre management team at the National, uh, at the Cottesloe. And uh, again, it was an interesting time to be there because I joined with Richard Eyre, uh, who was the artistic director at that time. And he was then superseded by Trevor Nunn, um, who took over as the next artistic director. So being in a building when artistic directors change is a really interesting time because there's a lot of things that happen at those points. and and and. Again, being on the outside of it all, when you're watching and learning, it's quite nice because you always have a honeymoon time because, you know, of course, you know, the, the, the buck doesn't stop with you. So you can learn from what's going on and study that and see what's happening. And I stood and just watched what was going on. And, and it was it was complicated. It wasn't an easy changeover. Uh, I have uh, amazing respect for both those artistic directors. Um, I mean, my first show at the National was uh, King Lear, which starred Ian Holm. Then I did the original production of Closer. Uh, then I worked on a Tennessee Williams play called Not About Nightingales, which was an undiscovered Tennessee Williams play that, that happened. And then my last show there amongst, I did several others, but one of the last shows I did there was a play called Copenhagen by Michael Frayn. Um, and it was an incredible time to be in that building and watch what was going on. And, and you know, you realise that it's very difficult for an artistic director coming on the back of another artistic director who'd been hugely successful. And Trevor Nunn was a very successful director in his own right. But there's an expectation of press and there's a lot of emotion that you yourself are, are coming through and and also the risk that you know you could you could fail and you could fail monumentally and actually how you process that and and i had always watched it in the same with producing in a way i think artistic directorship can be quite the same because you lead a team but it's also very lonely at times because you know the decisions you have to stand by the decisions you're taking which is why you you need to think about those choices very, very carefully. They they require huge responsibility because you've got lots of people who are under your care and stewardship and guidance when you're leading a team. And so those choices that you make become incredibly important ones. And and you know, the more you 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 gain success as someone like Trevor Nunn, who'd gone off and had worked commercially in theatre and had run the Royal Shakespeare Company before he'd become to the national, those those things were incredibly you know extraordinary um uh challenges for him because it was sort of the last part of his tapestry of his career to probably come there and work in leading the theater he's gone on obviously to direct many more shows afterwards but it's the biggest theater in the uk it has all you all the eyes on it um and it's a bit of one of those things we you say you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't there's always going to be a government opinion uh, and a critical opinion on what you're doing and trevor got a lot of um flack for doing a lot of musicals although again i would start argue that you know if you were doing Oklahoma or South Pacific and some of those shows you were actually going into a great classical canon of works which should be as respected as much as our classic plays but what Trevor doesn't get a lot of acclaim for is he did more new plays than any other artistic director in the history of the National Theatre and he came and he created a, a, a space a studio space that he built and out of that 
became a, a huge uh, legacy of, of playwrights that today, uh, you know, writing on a lot of our main stages. And that becomes because of Trevor Nunn, and he doesn't get the accolade of that that he that he duly deserves. Um, and at that point, anyway, it felt after a period of time, I took the Cottesloe through to its modernization, and it was the right time for me to start to step out and begin my own producing journey. And at that point, Michael Codron, who I continued, obviously, to, to, to be friends and, and, and a colleague with, became the consultant on my company, and I began producing. And the first show I produced was a show that was at Hampstead Theatre in London. It was called Shylock by a man called Gareth Armstrong, not to be confused with a play by Arnold Wesker, which uh, is uh, another play that was quite a legendary play in, in the 80s for, for many reasons. It wasn't that play. It was a play by Gareth Armstrong. Uh, we did it there. And then I knew if I took it to Edinburgh, to the Edinburgh Fringe, where I'd been before, it was a great place to make a lot of connections. And it is a show that I actually I'd found in Edinburgh, actually I'd, I'd seen it in Edinburgh the year before in a tiny venue at the Fringe. So I knew I could probably bring that show, which I did, put it on at Hampstead Theatre and make it a bit bigger by doing that, and then take it back to Edinburgh. And because it had already been successful in Edinburgh, I could get a venue quite easily to put the show on. So I got it into quite a well-known venue called the Assembly Rooms in Edinburgh. And what it did was, it meant that I could reach out to a lot of people because I had a show there and start to build those connections. And because Edinburgh is an international festival, immediately I could start to build out a series of international connections. So I did that play first, then I did something completely off the wall next, which was that I did a musical called Of The I Sing. I didn't want people to second guess always what I was producing. Again, it was coming back to saying, liking lots of different things. And so in that situation, what happened was I, 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 I did a musical called of the Ice Sing is by George and Ira Gershwin. If you don't know it, it's a really good musical to go and look at now because it actually involves uh, presidential debates and elections. It's the first ever musical that won a Pulitzer Prize. George Kaufman, who wrote the book, uh, the play, The Man Who Came to Dinner and many other plays wrote the book for it. And it all involves about how you impeach a president in a comedy musical with a tremendous political satire. And I put that show on in London and uh, in, a, in an off West End theatre and it was, it was quite successful. And then I, after that, did a, a brand new play called Anna Weiss, uh, which was about false memory syndrome. And um, then I took that internationally uh, sometime after that through a relationship I made in, in Edinburgh. I was able to do that show in Brazil. Um, so that opened up an international connection there. And then I took a show to the US uh, and it was very tentative steps, I have to say, but it then started to work out the international canvas that I was working on and the British Council had got to know what, a little bit about what I was doing. And I was also fortunate that I'd um, received a Society of London Theatre uh, New Producers Award. I'd won one of the first awards of a scheme that they'd created to encourage new producers so that gave me a little bit of money uh, from the grant that they gave me to start my company and that really was the sort of beginning of, of that journey but what I'd, I'd say is that in everything I produce that path leads me back to Norwich Theatre Royal and it also leads me back to an extraordinary man who ran that theatre and this man was a man called Dick Condon and Dick Condon was the first man who ever gave me my first ever piece of advice in theatre and Dick was this formidable Irishman he used to stand in the lobby of the theatre he'd been brought over to sort of save Norwich Theatre Royal in the 70s so he, he turned into a very successful theatre so by the time I was going in the 80s this theatre was thriving and he would stand and one of the things was he would go out and he would meet his audience and one day going into the theatre this intimidating Irishman was standing and I thought I've got to go and ask him about working in the theatre and I went up and I said to him and again I was about 12 and I said excuse me Mr Condon can you give me any advice for someone who wants to work in the theatre and he said theatres are not run from sitting behind desks and I have to say, best piece of theatre advice I've ever been given, because actually it really isn't. You know, you can get caught up in in the fact that now with HR and all these different things that go on with theatre, that fundamentally, you know, it's like there's just piles and piles of paperwork that, you know, inevitably is the, is, is the way that the, 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 the industries and businesses work in. You can get bombarded on that paperwork. But what you mustn't forget, ultimately, that what we do is we put shows on for audiences to come in and watch shows. And that's not running from behind a desk. It's running from being out there and running your theatre and driving it. And, you know, you get you need to get the balance of getting all those things, those things, things right and, and working together. Um, let's talk a little bit, because I know a couple of people are asking me a few questions about um, the differences between um, theatre in, uh, in, in the UK and, and, and elsewhere. Uh, or, or let's talk first about um, uh, the structures of UK theatre, just in case some of you may not know all, all exactly how it works. So in the UK, there are fundamentally commercial and subsidised theatres. So commercial is if you think about um, the West End. Um, so you think about all those shows where those musicals play and, and, and plays will play on those stages. Um, so you've got Theatre Audrey Lane, you know, Her Majesty's Theatre, what we would fundamentally call Theatre Land. 
and that is the commercial West End. Um, outside of that, you've got commercial theatres in the UK. Now, they may be very large, what we call number one touring houses. Our theatres are basically graded in terms of touring houses in size. So you've got number one touring houses, they're about 850 seats upwards. Then you've got number two touring houses, which are you know, up to about 800 seats, 500 seat theatres. Um, and then you've got the smaller houses, which is probably called number threes or, or, or even fringe houses in, in, in some of that context. So the commercial theatre is not government funded. It's possibly funded regionally with its towns and cities. If it's got a, a theatre like Norwich Theatre Royal, they may well get a grant that comes from the local council, helps them support it. But they are fundamentally there having to make money and turn over to be able to put their shows on. Then you've got the subsidised sector. So the subsidised sector is, um, for example, Birmingham Repertory Theatre. It's, uh, it's theatres that are producing houses. Um, they are often making their own work. They might be co-producing with productions and producers. But what they are doing is um, they are fundamentally putting their own shows on. So the Royal Shakespeare Company, the National Theatre, sit at the bigger end of that spectrum. So Birmingham Rep, which is a, a fairly large um, producing theatre, um uh in uh in in the uk is is a government funded theater and obviously those those grants which come from the arts council of england or if you're in scotland the arts council of scotland are an amount of money that's matched by the local council and other funders and that is how their operation works um sometimes a co-producer who's a commercial producer might work with a producing theatre to, to, to put up a show that show might then transfer into the west end it might tour and then go on into the west end then alongside that, you've also got fringe. So the fringe is a, a, a quite interesting movement. So obviously you've got smaller venues that are coming out, um, that are coming uh, on. They're often pop-up theatres. They're effectively, uh, uh, you know, very much running on, on a shoestring budget. Um, the growth of fringe in the UK actually grows out of the fact that we had stage censorship in the UK right up until the late 1960s. And a lot of these theatres wanted to put on plays that were not deemed appropriate plays. And if you go back into to British theatre history, it's very interesting to see what they deemed as appropriate or, or, or not appropriate in those times. So a movement began in London and elsewhere, which was a fringe scene that grew. Um, the fringe scene basically operated as clubs. So people would pay a small fee of, say, I don't know, one pound for club membership. But by being a club, they sat outside of theatre licensing and it meant they could put these plays on. So you took club membership and then you went and watched those shows. And what it did was it created a very vibrant fringe and it created a pocket of writers who were very, very important writers that have subsequently come through our stages and, and, and gone on elsewhere. The Edinburgh Fringe began a little differently. So the Edinburgh Fringe comes out of the fact that when um, the uh, Second World War ended in the UK, there was a feel that they wanted to create an arts festival, an international arts festival that would bring countries together. And the Edinburgh International Festival came as a consequence of that. Uh, it's quite interesting if you look at the history of the Edinburgh International Festival because the first shows that they chose to put in those years just following the Second World War were the first shows to be programmed was a show from Germany, a show from Italy, I think a show from Japan as well. So, you know, it was really about unity and bringing people together. However, a group of artists were very annoyed to be being left out of the Edinburgh Fringe. And so six companies who decided, uh, out of the, uh, sorry, annoyed about being left out of the Edinburgh International Festival. So six companies um, uh, decided that they were just going to go up and pitch in Edinburgh at the same time in any case, and they would create a fringe festival that went around the main international festival. And that's really how the Edinburgh Fringe began. So it began with six companies who rolled up into Edinburgh as a sort of, you know, anti-festival against the international festival. And those from that, those seeds, it grew. So from those six companies to 2019, because of course there wasn't a festival in 2020, there was 3,800 performances in Edinburgh last uh, last year. So, um, you know, as they say, out of, out of little acorn, big trees can grow. And, and that certainly was the case within, within that structure. Just to flip to America for a second, because it's a little bit different. In America, you've got the commercial theatre, which is Broadway and all those houses. You've got then um, uh, uh, what we would call subscriber theatres. And they're not quite the same as subsidised theatres. 
members because subscribers take a membership for their theatre and that's fundamentally how it's supported. So Chicago Shakespeare Theatre is a subscriber theatre and so the subscriber membership is taken and that's basically uh, how the theatre you know, earns its income. Uh, it's a much more precarious structure in some ways because if you hit a problem as is now when there's not work going on its stages it can lose subscriber support um, and the theatres can be in quite a lot of peril and, and challenges because of that. So there's a lot of reliance on donations. I mean, one of the big differences is to sit on a board of a theatre in the UK, you're not expected to donate money. To sit on the board of a theatre in the US, you are. And so again, you may see very long lists of board members and um, uh, you can see how the um, the structure of, uh, of money has to be driven by having that many board members on a, on a board to be able to fundamentally fund your theatre. And then there's also Off West End and Off Broadway. Off West End is sort of an emergence, which is sort of an extension of what Fringe was, so sort of a Off West End companies so theatres like the Donmar Warehouse and the Almeida Theatre which you might know and then in um, in Broadway you've got um, off Broadway. Um, I would actually say on one note about um, one of the differences to be aware of when you look at theatre and if any of you are thinking about taking work internationally particularly thinking about the US um, and indeed the UK there can be a lot of excitement about that vision of Wow, London, that's the place I've got to do a show, New York, because they're the places we hear about actually such a lot. But fundamentally, in terms of getting creative footholds in places, it's sometimes looking at what is the places that can actually sit and actually serve me better as a show. And I would say one of the things about Chicago, to me, it's the most important um, uh, new writing theatre city in, in America. If you didn't have Chicago, you'd have no new writing economy. And there's a reason behind this. And it's actually a reason as we look at COVID at the moment and what's going on in the world as to why it may be a really important step to look back and look at some of these things. Because, you see, Chicago's theatre scene grew out of storefront movements. So storefronts were effectively pop-up um, pop-up shops. Um, so during a period of time that Chicago hit in the sort of late 60s, it hit a very bad time of, of depression. Many shops closed down in its city and the city centre and the town was really, you know, the city was really falling into quite a bad way. However, a group of artists turned up in Chicago and said, can we start to put theatres into some of these empty shops? Can we put up some pop-up theatres? And um, amongst those artists were people like David Mamet, Tracy Letts, uh, actors like John Malkovich, um, Gary Sinise, and these theatres, uh, the city said, yes, we need something to do with these buildings. We'll put some pop-up theatres into these theatres. At the same time, uh, pop-up theatres into these shop, empty shops. At the same time, the Chicago Tribune, which at that point was the most syndicated newspaper after the New York Times across America, undertook that it would review every show that was in one of these theatres. Now, because it was only two hours away from New York, it meant that New York producers and New York theatre owners could start to read about what was going on in Chicago. It wasn't that hard to get there. But the strength was it wasn't New York. It was building its own theatre ecology and its own theatre scene. And of course, out of that began this storefront movement. And out of that became a whole generation of American writers and particularly young urban writers, but also so descended actors because actors started to realise if you were in Chicago long enough, not only would you get picked up and, and, and put into a show potentially, and you know you knew you would work. You, if you were a writer, you knew sooner or later you'd get your play put on. And that philosophy in Chicago still continues today. So Chicago Shakespeare Theatre begins its journey, you know, 30 odd years ago as a storefront theatre put together by a lady called Barbara Gaines who remains Chicago Shakespeare Theatre's artistic director but who wanted to just have an ambition to put Shakespeare on in the city and put it up in a storefront theatre. Steppenwolf which is one of the big new writing theatres now in America begins out of a storefront and so that ecology of storefront movement is incredibly important and actually one of the reasons why, you know, America's theatre scene is so strong is because of Chicago. And even now, there's a whole generation of uh, younger artists coming to that city and still putting on work and putting it into storefronts. And why it's important, as I say, in contrast to New York or London, is that Chicago gave people the courage to fail. Um, New York and London, two of the hardest, in fact, the hardest places to produce a show in the world, actually, are, are London and Sydney. And I'll come on to why that is in just a second. But in... Um, in, New, in a lot of these cities, and New York is a tough city as well, there is this folding of your arms and saying, show us what you got. Whereas in these cities, you can hone it and get it right and make it and make it work and make it be successful. And, and more 
importantly, commercial theater owners started to realize this as well. So that's why now there was a very large commercial number of theaters in, in Chicago. The first production of Hamilton outside of New York began in Chicago. Um, uh, the producers, the big Mel Brooks musical, it began its life in Chicago because what they've built is they've built a very smart theater going audience, which means you can test and try out work in that city and see if it works before you take it somewhere else. And of course, with the millions of pounds that are involved with producing a Broadway show, that time to hone it and get it right before really smart, honest audiences becomes really important because you can quickly fail if you go into a marketplace like London or New York where there is an expectation of what you're waiting for. Why Sydney is a difficult city to produce and comes back to a, a question that I would actually you know, throw out to you all to think about, which is, are some cities naturally more creative than others? Is, is there a reason why um, a city like Dublin or a city like Edinburgh a city like Paris uh, or a city like Chicago effectively are more creative than other cities you know is it purely coincidental that that litany of great writers that come out of Dublin come out of Dublin because it's Dublin or does it actually have something to do much more with its you know, ecology of what its city is and how it's structured because I would argue that it possibly is and I, I think if you look at cities that are particularly creative it could also have something to do simply with the fact of um uh, a very strong city where people walk in the streets, uh, a city where people, so the people are not driving, cities that have good public transport systems, um, cities which have a cafe and strong pub culture. If you look back to those history of those places, there's places where there's community and, and what you'd effectively call cultural collisions. Because if you've got cities which engender that, so you've got cities where people are walking and talking more rather than driving, you will always start to develop conversation. Out of conversation will come ideas, and out of ideas, obviously, eventually will, will, will possibly, if you're artists, come, come, come shows. But therefore, do these cities grow much, much quicker and become much more creatively stable in themselves than other places where, for example, if you look at Sydney, if there's a, certainly a creative hub there, but in a sense, people are driving much more. So to try and make that motion of creative development is where you sort of end up because people have heard you better go and see it uh, by reading it in the newspaper than necessarily sitting down to the person in the street or, or standing next to you on the bus who's talking about a show and saying how much they think that show is interesting or that you need to go and see it. So are these places where creative conversations happen in a very different way? I mean, if you look at the contrast between Melbourne and Sydney, it's enormous. In effect, you could almost say Melbourne, uh, you, know, you know, Melbourne's the book and Sydney's the movie because Melbourne, again, has this interconnection of people on the streets and its cafes and its talking and its creative hub. They're also a little bit cheaper as a city to live in Melbourne, maybe, than Sydney, so maybe it becomes economically more successful. But I also think it has a huge part that comes down into creative hub and, 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 and creative connection. Um, and, and obviously that I think feeds a lot of our you know, sort of creative ecology and as we look at COVID and things I also think that how we as an industry around the world globally start to look and, and figure out exactly how we sort of work together in, in the structures and uh, the role that the arts has to play in its cities, uh, its, its venues and its theatres and its producers play in the cities it lives in as much as, as anything else. I think we have a, a fundamental part in, in, in cultural recovery because I think coming out of COVID, we know there's going to be some some pretty tough times in, in you know, coming in, 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 in ahead of us. Um, I had a question that came in that asked me, uh, how different was it when you worked in India? Uh, well, I mean, I mean, you know, uh, uh, the great thing about touring the pretty shows is that you learn a lot as you go along. I mean, yeah, look, there's, there's massive differences. I mean, uh, uh, I, I, one of the things I was amazed about, first of all, was that, uh, that we, were, we were being asked, uh, well, I was, firstly, I was very interested about how the structure of um, uh, the Indian theatre scene worked. Um, I found it interesting about the way of how can you connect with young and new audiences. One of the things I found interesting to start with was I started to say, I'm looking for new writers. I'm looking for new writing. And they kept saying to me, uh, there's a number of people, why wouldn't you work with someone who was established? And of course, what I realized quite quickly was new writing meant something different. It meant that, yes, you could find an established writer with a new play. Um, but I was really interested about the fact of how the Bollywood theatre scene and the cinema scene, which I knew, but just how dominant a factor that was in India. And maybe that theatre at times was sort of slightly pushed into a slightly secondary position. And at first, I was being offered a lot of plays that weren't kind of quite what I was interested in, because I was, for example, when I was in Mumbai, I became really interested in 
in um, urban Hindi and that language. And that's partly because I've worked a bit in hip hop uh, in terms of theatre musical and theatre creation. I've done a couple of hip hop Shakespeare shows, one called Othello the Remix, which was a, a show that I developed at Chicago Shakespeare Theatre and was Shakespeare's Glow. And it's partly because um, I found this fantastic group of artists from Chicago called the Q Brothers. Uh, their first show I produced was called Funk It Up About Nothing, which was a hip hop retelling of Much Ado About Nothing that we did in Australia and in Chicago and in New York and in London. Um, and on the back of that, we decided that we wanted to commission them to create a new show. And we were all really interested in um, the structure of Shakespeare um, for a number of reasons as to how we might be able to engage with young people because hip hop and Shakespeare, as you may know, uses almost the same iambic pentameter. So if you have a group of young people who come in to do a hip hop, watch a hip hop show or can do hip hop, then if you do an educational masterclass afterwards, they can almost do Shakespeare and deliver text of Shakespeare within 30, 35 minutes. And I always believe if, you know, Shakespeare was alive today, he'd frankly be Eminem or Jay-Z, because the wonderful thing about Shakespeare is that, you know, he made up words. He made up, you know, he was a poet. He was a, a Jew. And actually, uh, when you look at a lot of hip hop and those structures, that music formulates in exactly the same structure. So Othello, the remix, we did for London 2012 Olympics, and then we toured it for several years afterwards. And I was I was really interested in the way in which um we could take the theme of a piece like uh, Othello and find it could connect in a certain way. And again, as I say, about looking about how work might instinctively connect or how it might work in, in, in terms of cultural connections. And I was, I was very interested in um, the way in which uh, as I say, Othello is a story of jealousy and, 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 and rage could, could translate into the world of hip hop. So basically the story became that Othello was the greatest hip hop artist in the world. Iago was the jealous front man who was always, uh, never getting the top spot. So that gave him the motivation for the, for the, for the, for the jealousy. You know, Desdemona becomes the, 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 the girl who is Othello's, you know, girl on his arm who Iago is jealous of. And actually the themes of rage and jealousy that kind of sometimes inspired part of the hip-hop scene lent themselves very successfully into trying to create something that would work in uh, in uh, another part of the part of the world to take it on to a younger audience and when I got to India I was really interested in that scene of urban hip-hop and urban Hindi and just the street languages that were being used but I wasn't seeing those necessarily being propelled in the same way into Indian theatre and so the way I managed to find finally a way of connecting with uh, a lot of people about the sort of work that I was particularly interested in what I was looking for was I started to utilize the fact of um, trying to explain against Indian movies the sort of type of writing I was looking for and I like a lot of Indian films but there's one Indian movie I particularly like which is a film called Wednesday uh, which some of you may know um, and Wednesday is a great uh, Indian you know, movie it deals a lot with the, you know, the drug scenes of Mumbai I think it's a really fantastic movie um, there's a lot of them I like uh, I like Black Friday as well there's, there's got a lot of Indian films that, 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 I, that I find quite interesting and I think Indian the Indian film and scene and the writing scene is, is really strong which is why I say I'm, I'm really interested about how that voice could translate into theatre so I would use Wednesday as quite a good contextual point so if I met writers and they were talking I said well, I'm not sort of looking I'm sort of like interested in the themes of you know I, I don't want a Wednesday as a, as, a, as, a, as a play but I'm interested in that sort of style of writing and I found that that was a very interesting way that you could hook and explain you know what you wanted but that's never the way I've ever had to do it necessarily in other places around the world as easily um, then I was interested in India about how the group movement scenes work how that how that uh, you know crossover works of different things and and then I was interested about the exchanging of knowledge and the exchanging of ideas because I mean, I, I'll tell you, when I produce a show, um, when I pick up a play, I'm looking for one simple thing, and that is I'm looking at theme. So, and by theme, I mean, obviously, story, but what I actually mean is emotional theme. So what I'm looking for is uh, a play that you can connect, and maybe there's elements to that theme or that emotion that you can connect with in your own life. Uh, the greatest moments when you watch a theatre show and it doesn't happen very often, but if you can get it, it's golden. It's like an invisible hand that's come out of the stage and it's taken yours and it's pulled you into the stage. And if you can get, I mean, we talked earlier about exchange. If you can get that exchange happening in the theatre, it's it's golden because it can really connect with something in an amazing way. And why I'm so interested in artists from around the world is that actually I think the world is very small. 
And I think that actually there is an exchanging of knowledge that means that you can take a story, maybe by a playwright from India, and actually you can find the theme and the emotion that connects there in a, in, in a certain way with your own life. And if you look at it, that's why we're so invested in such a big way with someone like, uh, you know, why we still invest so much in Romeo and Juliet, because actually the heart of Romeo and Juliet is not about two kids, uh, you know, in Verona. It's about two kids falling in love. It's about how we connect with the emotional arc of that journey. And that's what makes it a timeless play. So in a way, I'm, I'm often looking for work that is work that I can say, wow, that, that, that timelessness I, I, I connect with and I understand it in a, in a certain way and I can build a cultural connection. So I may be you know, living miles and miles apart from, from, that, from, from, from that story or that, that environment, but I still connect with the emotional heart of it. And, and when I look at a play, that becomes a very important thing to me. And I mean, to use that in a, in a particular way, I've done quite a lot of work in, in South Africa and um, I was very fortunate to come into my life uh, a, a playwright um, called Umpile Malusi. And Umpile Malusi was a playwright who'd grown up in the townships. He'd had quite a tough upbringing um, and he was a, a writer whom I discovered through the Royal Shakespeare Company. Um, and the, the way it happened was that uh, Umpile had been uh, uh, in street gangs as a kid. Um, he had spent a short time in, in prison because of that. He'd been brought up by his grandmother. Um, so he'd had a tough time, like a lot of youngsters growing up in South Africa, but he'd grown up in the Itzaseng Township. And Itzaseng was a township that was forgotten in the new democracy of South Africa. So when Mandela came to power, there was two or three townships that were forgotten in this, and Itzaseng was one of them. They, they arrived with Mandela taking power with so much hope and belief that you know everything would change in fact what they did was they burnt down their shopping center in the center of it's the same believing that the new south africa would build them an even better shopping center today it still stands in it's the same as a burnt wreck and shell um this that particular township has a lot of issues with drugs as do many but there are a lot of a lot of core issues that that, 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 that sit in, in in those environments but out of that umpile grew up and out of that umpile discovered he had an interest in telling stories and so um, one day the market theater in South Africa that used to tour with a, a, um, a laboratory, it still does, that goes from township to township putting shows on, came to his township and he watched this on stage and his eyes were opened up to storytelling. And he, um, he said to uh, the person who was running that, um, you know, I would like to be a, be a playwright. I'd like to be an actor, actually, I'd like to be an actor. And they said, well, that's great, but you don't speak English. You speak you know, a number of other Afrikaners languages, but you don't speak English. And so he went away motivated to um, teach himself how to speak English. And he did that through listening to hip hop, reading the works of Shakespeare and reading the Bible. Um, and slowly he sort of taught himself how to, how to speak English. And when he thought he was good enough, he went by bus to Johannesburg, turned up at the market theatre and asked him for an audition. Uh, of course, they weren't expected to see him. He just suddenly turned up. But he auditioned and explained uh, how he got there. And he got into that uh, into that programme and training. And he went on to become uh, uh, a very successful actor in South Africa. He came into my life because of a man called Brett Golden. And Brett Golden was... Uh, a pretty amazing white South African actor. And he was in a production of Hamlet, which the Royal Shakespeare Company and the Baxter Theatre in Cape Town were doing together. Um, it's been directed by the South African um, director and who lives in the UK, but called Janet Sussman. At the end of that run in Cape Town at the Baxter, just before it was going to the Royal Shakespeare Company, Brett and another man sadly were um, abducted and murdered um, in a botched robbery. And in his memory, the Royal Shakespeare Company created a bursary to award a young writer or actor to come over to work with them at the company. And Umpile received the first bursary to come over. And so he came from first ever trip out of South Africa to the RSC and arrived and he got there. And in his bag was a play he'd been writing. And this, this play was called It's the Same story about his township. It was a story about what happens when you're looking for change in a new democracy. It's what happens about, it's, you know, it's, it's a, it was a play that dealt with, um, you know, displacement really, and a community that's displaced in a world. And um, uh, the RSC called me up and said, do you think you could come down and see this? We can't produce it, but we're going to do two special readings of this play. And I think it's someone who could do with some help trying to develop his play and, and structure and work within that. So I went down and I watched um, this reading and it was pretty extraordinary. 
Um, and this reading kind of like just absolutely blew me away. And uh, at the end of it, we sat down and we had a talk and we talked about a way of trying to see if we could get it on. And uh, at that point, a man, a wonderful man called Manny Manon was running the Baxter Theatre in Cape Town and he wanted to put it on for six weeks. So we put that show on and then we took it to the Edinburgh Fringe. We took it to the Market Theatre, went to the Edinburgh Fringe and then it went to the Dublin Theatre Festival because uh, Edinburgh was such a great Dublin, Dublin Theatre Festival and it went to Adelaide Theatre Festival. We did it in uh, Chicago. That's one of the journeys that brought me my relationship and built my relationship with Chicago Shakespeare Theatre because we took it there there because they, they'd seen it and wanted to produce it. And we then commissioned Umpile's next play, which is called Cader, with the Chicago Shakespeare Theatre and the Market Theatre. But the thing about why that play worked, and as I said to you about theme and connection and emotion, was because I could put a play on about displacement set in South Africa in a township, and I knew that someone who was watching it in South Central LA or in, you know, downtown Chicago in one of the, the projects down there, of which a lot of those theatres had a relationship of bringing people in, would come in and watch that show and stand up and say, I connect with it. Uh, you know, I understand this. And we had some incredible debates. And I think what you do is, again, it's like that invisible hand coming out of the out of the stage, that exchange of taking that hand and pulling it in. And those audiences connected in an incredible way. And I think that's the power often about international work, sometimes more than you, you can do, sometimes with, even with a UK to, to UK audience. Sometimes that international perspective makes you think in a much bigger way. And that to me is, is one of the biggest concerns about COVID at the moment, uh, is the fact of where do we sit with new writing? Where do we sit with um, the, 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 the aspect of um, the way in which we can find a way of of, of, of making sure that we keep these cultural connections flowing. I mean, look, I mean, the first thing that happened understandably with COVID was that borders closed. You know, we, we shut down those, those connections. So, okay, we went digitally. Well, digital is, is fantastic. It's been a savior, don't get me wrong, but it's not the savior of theater. Digital is a component. It's a component that we can't not just stop people going to live theater to experience that. It means we can create digital collaborations, but we've got to be very careful at how we embrace digital so we get the balance to that completely right and we make it work in, in a way. What we can do is we can create some amazing connections digitally, but actually fundamentally it comes, theater comes from actually groups of people sat in the same room, sharing ideas and talking about stuff. And actually often that comes from different countries sitting together and sharing those ideas. So the first thing, as I say, is that, you know, with COVID, it, it does worry me about will our theatre ecology change in a really dramatic way because we're sitting there in a situation of of not having these cultural exchanges in quite the same way as we're used to. I think also it's become, when you watch the news, we have so much news that's without consequence. So if I want to get information about what's happening in India due to COVID, I might get one random piece of news that comes once every three or four weeks on our main BBC news channel or BBC 10 o'clock news, but I'm not hearing it consistently. And in a way, it's a bit like out of sight, out of mind. And I think if you take that same analogy in theatre, if you don't keep yourselves active and that momentum driving, you become out of sight and out of mind. In a way, COVID is something that's, you know, and as I say, there will be a time when we don't talk about the new normal anymore. We just hopefully it'll get back to being normal. What I just say within that is what you don't want to do is end up with a normal where everything that's gone before is now forgotten because we've sort of not kept the, the you know, we've, it's been asleep. We've, we've forgotten. We're not exactly we've forgotten about it. It's just in a way it's forgotten us. Our audiences have forgotten us. And in a way, we as artists have to make sure that our presence is as strong as it ever has been because there is an incredibly big opportunity with COVID because there is a fact of coming out of it. If you look at it on the positive of saying there is an opportunity here that we all of us on this discussion together are actually a very important and integral part of what the future of theatre will be next and the roles and the decisions we make there are really really um important to to take forward and, and think about where we go next and and where we go within that so certainly you know the the, the vision and where we we head to next becomes an incredibly important one and I think that's really an important one for, 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 for new writing, especially. And, uh, you know, our, our future of new writing really depends on, on how we drive forward and take through those those voices and what happens next. And that's across every art form. That's through musical writing, uh, new, you know, uh, new, new, new writing. We have to encourage writers also to be able to think about writing bigger plays. And can they, you know, can they get their work onto bigger stages? How do we do that? And in a way, at this point coming forwards, I suppose my vision is that we have to be the greatest facilitators in that. But it also starts at 
the grassroots. It starts at that fact of looking about ways that we have to be creative and innovative in our journeys. So we're thinking about how do we structure that with taking those journeys forward? Can we build our cities so they become pop-up theatres and cultural hubs? What do we do with education? How do we think about it now that a young person who wants to work in the theatre just isn't put off because he doesn't see that there's any opportunities there that, 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 that can help him? How do we facilitate that? Because in theatre, you know, you need to know where you came from to know how to get back. If you don't consider that point, if you just think about yourself in it all, you're not going to actually help that ecology. And we're only part of that for a short time. And none of us, I would hope, would want our legacies to be one where we were just the generation who actually basically thought about ourselves and we didn't think about what was coming next. So I used to say my, my vision for theatre is probably more so than ever about cultural exchange, you know, collaboration, and crucially cultural collisions. Because actually, that's the only way that we as a group will, I think, continue to, 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 to move forward, going forwards within that and, 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 and take work forwards together. And actually, we really have to look at, you know, in some ways, some of the decisions that our government are taking. And, you know, theatre people are, are the best at being told when you can't do something to stand up and say, yes, we can. And however weather beaten we might feel, the ability to need to stand up and say, yes, we can, is never more important than ever. And... You know, I think, as I say, you ask your question, what happens to hope at the end of the evening? And, you know, in, in theatre, you know, producing in theatre comes down to one very simple thing. Um, and I'll, I'll leave you this just before we sort of finish up. The skills of producing, really, ultimately, anyone can do it. Uh, it. It comes with a basis of knowledge, but it, actually a lot of it comes also with a lot of common sense. And what I say with that is you put work on that you believe in, you know, so long as you know the reason behind your choice of what you're doing, it, that's OK. Producing is instinctive, so it's entrusting your instinct, it's following your knowledge, but the instinct comes from a building of knowledge. It comes with a business sense because we work in a business that's called show business. Often people forget the business side of the show, but the business side is very, very important because it's the glue of what you're doing. So you've got to think about that carefully and approach it with a pragmatic and common sense of what you're doing. And then um, within that, it's about communication. You know, we work in an industry that is all about communicating with each other. It's about talking. It's about exchange. And to commit out of communication comes teamwork and comes collaboration, because collaboration is our absolute glue to what we all do, be that on a local, national or international scene. And then ultimately, of course, it's it's that taking your time to breathe and learn in an industry. You know, you don't come out of medical school and the next day say I'm a brain surgeon. There's this desire to be in such a rush to do stuff now. And it's partly because it's a Twitter culture. We spend our lives, a lot of people looking at Twitter and feeling we're somewhere behind because everyone's posting what they're doing. And for some reason, we feel we're so much behind than everyone else. But, you know, actually, the race is only ever with yourself. And in this industry, you need to allow yourself time to breathe because actually that's one of the best things. That honeymoon period when you first start in the theatre if there's, if there's new people entering the business who are watching it now, the water's very warm and we need more people coming through because your ideas are what keep us going. But also within that, um, you know, that is that is the fuel of, of, of a life in the theatre, which is the life in the theatre is about what you do next. And the last thought I would say is that probably to leave you with is what do producers look like? Well, you're looking at me, OK? Um, you know, if you looked at a, a dancer, I don't know, if you looked at Burishnikov, you know, or you looked at uh, and you said, what, what do you think? You didn't know what he did. You looked at Mikhail Bushkov and you said, what do you think he does? You might say, yeah, look at him. Yeah, maybe he's a maybe he's a dancer. Or you look at one of the Kapoor family. You didn't know what they do. Maybe you say, what do, you, what, what do you think they do? You might say, yeah, maybe they're an actor. Look at a producer. OK, producers don't look like anything. But if they look like anything, they look like optimists because your entire life is based on optimism. You know, if you get those other fundamental producing skills right, and you take the time to learn and build them, then the optimism is what gives you the courage to get back on the horse when you fall off. Because inevitably, a life as a producer does mean you're going to fall off the horse a few times. And so does it mean in any building of creative industries. If you get those other elements right, then actually all of that is going to give you the basis and the foundation to have a long, and hopefully enjoyable career. Because it's got to be fun. You know, there's much easier ways of getting a living, frankly. So if you're going to do something, then you've got to have fun to do it. But you've got to be creatively rewarded by it. So as I say, you know, it's about that belief in yourself, the trust of your knowledge. But it only comes with building your own theatre knowledge and your own confidence and trust within it. And as I say, in, 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 the, in the future, the vision of theatre, it's about giving back. 
you know what we put into an industry is what we get back with it and you know as i say beyond this conversation i hope there will be ideas and things that you know you'll exchange together and there'll be ideas and exchanges that we'll exchange together and i hope out of that that you know from this conversation i may be introduced to another whole group of new writers in an industry that never stops learning so i hope that's you know s some thought to go away with um i look forward to hearing about your journeys and you know thank you for inviting me to to be here and take part today um thank you for the questions i think i've tried to answer as many as you have <laughs> given me thank you for the the messages and, and, and kind words um and as i say if there's anything that you need to know arushi who um is uh, also works for Birmingham Repertory Theatre, uh, is someone who I know will be able to also collate and pass, you know, questions on and, and, and things like that. So, you know, thank you very much for asking me to be here today and, and you know, all the best and stay well. And, and of course, most importantly, here's until we can all be together in theatres again.